Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the American Outdoor Brands third quarter 2019 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode, so if anyone should require assistance during the call, please press star, then zero on your touchtone telephone to reach an operator. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. As a reminder, today's conference is being recorded. I'd now like to introduce your host for today's conference, Ms. Liz Sharp, Vice President of Investor Relations. Ma'am, please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon. Our comments today may contain predictions, estimates, and other forward-looking statements. Our use of words like anticipate, project, estimate, expect, intend, believe, and other similar expressions is intended to identify those forward-looking statements. Forward-looking statements also include statements regarding revenue, earnings per share, non-GAAP earnings per share, fully diluted share count, and tax rate for future periods. Our product development, focus, objectives, strategies, and vision, our strategic evolution, our market share and market demand for our products, market and inventory conditions related to our products and in our industry in general, and growth opportunities and trends. Our forward-looking statements represent our current judgment about the future, and they are subject to various risks and uncertainties, risk factors and other considerations that could cause our actual results to be materially different are described in our securities filings, including our forms 8K, 10K, and 10Q. You can find those documents as well as a replay of this call on our website at aob.com. Today's call contains time-sensitive information that is accurate only as of this time, and we assume no obligation to update any forward-looking statements. Our actual results could differ materially from our statements today. I have a few important items to note with regard to our comments on today's call. First, we reference certain non-GAAP financial measures on this call. Our non-GAAP results and guidance exclude goodwill impairment charges, the effects of tax reform, as well as acquisition-related costs, including amortization, one-time transition costs, changes in contingent consideration liability, fair value inventory step-up, and the tax effect related to all of those adjustments. The reconciliations of GAAP financial measures to non-GAAP financial measures, whether or not they are discussed on today's call, can be found in today's Form 8K filing, as well as today earning, today's earnings press release, which is posted on our website. Also, when we reference EPS, we are always referencing fully diluted EPS. For detailed information on our results, please refer to our quarterly report on Form 10Q for the period ending January 31, 2019, and our annual report on Form 10K for the year ended April 30, 2018. I will now turn the call over to James Debney, President and CEO of American Outdoor Brands. Thank you, Liz. Good afternoon, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. With me on today's call is Jeff Buchanan, our Chief Financial Officer. Later in the call, Jeff will provide a recap of our financial performance as well as our updated guidance. We are pleased with our third quarter operation on financial results, which reflect year-over-year -year increases in revenue and operating profit. In addition, we launched several new products and made great progress on our new logistics and customer services facility, an important strategic initiative in driving our long-term growth. With that, let me provide you some detail on the quarter. Sales on our outdoor products and accessories segment in Q3 declined 6.3% year over year. Within the segment, our outdoor products and accessories division delivered third quarter year over year sales growth of 4.3%. That organic growth however, was more than offset by declines in our electro-optics division, which were driven by ongoing weakness in market conditions. That said, the outdoor products and accessories segment overall generated gross margins of over 47% and generated more than 24% of our total revenue in the quarter. Sales growth occurred in both our hunting and shooting product categories, as well as our cutlery and tool product categories, and came from a variety of retailers, particularly our online retailers. Based upon reduced long-range forecasts in our electro-optics division, we have decided to restructure and combine that business into our outdoor products and accessories division. This restructuring will allow us to improve operating efficiencies while continuing to deliver the innovation and quality that our Crimson Trace brand has earned under the leadership of Lane Tobarzen. In connection with the restructuring, I am pleased to announce today that Lane has been promoted to president of our firearms division a role that I have occupied on an interim basis. 
With 14 years of leadership experience in the firearms industry, Lane has earned tremendous respect within our company and with all of our customers, and I'm excited to add his leadership, energy, and creative spirit to our, lead, our firearms team. As required prior to such a restructuring, we conducted an analysis to assess the fair value of the electro-optics division in Q3. As a result, we have recorded a partial impairment of goodwill for that business, which Jeff will address later in more detail. While the impairment is relatively small, it is obviously a disappointment to us, and it is driven by market conditions over the past several quarters. We maintain our positive, long-term view of the electro-optics business and the strategic role it will play in our future growth. In fact, during the third quarter, we expanded our electro-optics product offering by acquiring the assets of LaserLight, a provider of laser training and sighting products for the consumer market. This business has already been fully integrated, and we look forward to growing both the Crimson Trace and LaserLight brands. In our firearm segment for the third quarter, year-over-year -year revenue growth of 5.1% and higher gross margins reflected an ongoing consumer preference for many of our products. We continue to bundle, I'm sorry, we continue to benefit in the quarter from our successful bundle promotions that we booked in Q1 and shipped in both Q2 and Q3. As a reminder, these bundle promotions demonstrate our unique ability to create packages featuring our popular consumer brands and products from across our entire business. Turning now to adjusted NICS results, as you know, we transfer firearms only to law enforcement agencies and federally licensed distributors and retailers, not directly to end consumers. That said, adjusted NICS background checks are generally considered to be the best available proxy for consumer firearm demand. In Q3, background checks for handguns declined 8% year over year, while our units shipped to distributors and retailers increased 10%. For the same period, background checks for long guns declined 7% year over year, while our units shipped to distributors and retailers increased nearly 12%. In a more recent NICS update, February adjusted NICS results were issued on Tuesday of this week, and they were down 12.8% year over year. That number is the lowest adjusted NICS result for any February since 2011, and certainly appears to validate the ongoing challenging market conditions that we have recently referenced. Turning now to inventories, distributor inventories of our firearms decreased a total to a total of 141,000 units at the end of Q3 versus 175,000 units in Q3 of last year. Sequentially, distributor inventory increased very slightly from 135,000 units at the end of Q2. We have heard from our distributors and retailers that they are comfortable with their overall inventory levels and that our, our promotions are a match with the current weaker market conditions. The lower level of channel inventory in the current environment combined with our strong brands and promotional programs helped benefit our performance in the quarter. Since the end of Q3, distributor inventories have declined and our current weeks of sales at distribution are near our eight-week threshold. We are currently in the later stages of our industry's spring show season with distributors, buying groups, and strategic retailers, and we are pleased with the positive results. Our promotions featured several new bundles. Most popular among these have been the M&P 15 Sport 2 combined with a rifle case and a mag charger, and our TCR 22 combined with a rifle sling and a crimson trace optic. These two bundles generated revenue beginning in Q3, and we believe pulled a small amount of revenue from Q4 into Q3. Turning now to new products, innovation to support our organic growth strategy remains the highest priority across our entire business. Within each division, creative new product development teams are focused on innovation, guided by consumer trends to ensure that our products lead both the competitive marketplace and each relevant consumer segment that we target. We attended SHOT Show in January, where we displayed and launched a number of these exciting new products. Let me take you through some of them. Our electro-optics division showcased several new products that were introduced into the market in Q2, just prior to SHOT Show. These included five new innovative red dot sights for pistols and long guns, as well as the new Crimson Trace line of rifle scopes for hunting and target shooting. 
These scopes represent our first entry into the rifle scope market, reflecting our progress towards expanding the addressable market that the Crimson Trace brand can serve. Our outdoor products and accessories division displayed many new products, including the Coldwell Hydro Sled, Frankfurt Arsenal M Press, and a brand new hunting tripod, the Bog Death Grip. All these new products include patent pending features. The Coldwell Hydro Sled is the most advanced recoil reducing shooting rest on the market, delivering up to 95% felt recoil reduction. The Frankfurt Arsenal M Press marks Frankfurt's entry into the popular reloading press market. It was designed from the ground up to achieve accurate ammunition loads and provide years of heavy duty service. The Bog Death Grip Hunting Tripod is engineered to be the most stable shooting platform on the market. Its carbon fiber legs have unmatched durability for lifetime of hunts and its clamping system secures any firearm. In our firearms division, we introduced the Performance Center Ported M&P Shield M2.0, featuring a ported barrel for increased muzzle control and incorporating the popular M&P M2.0 feature set. This is an ideal choice for concealed carry. The Performance Center M442 revolver, designed with the hallmark Performance Center enhancements, including a two-tone finish, high-polished features, crimson trace laser grips, and a Performance Center tuned trigger action. And in our Thompson Center brand, we introduced the Impact SB muzzle loader, featuring a speed breach for rapid removal and easy cleaning. Now turning to a discussion of our new logistics and customer services facility in Missouri. As a reminder, this is an important strategic initiative that will centralize the logistics, warehousing, and distribution operations for all of our businesses, enabling growth, enhancing efficiencies, and allowing us to better serve customers across our entire organization. To date, we have successfully completed a series of interface, system, process, and software testing phases, and we are now running live orders through the system. And as a reminder, we have long utilized SAP in our company, so these activities are an extension of that system into the new facility, not a first-time SAP implementation. A very methodical ramp-up of volume and shipments is underway, and after the close of Q3, we successfully shipped our first firearms out of the new facility to selected distributors and buying groups. Our Springfield distribution location and our existing Missouri distribution location are both running in parallel and will continue to do so over the remainder of the testing phases until the full transition is complete later in the calendar year. Because of these steps, we believe our execution risk is relatively low and that level is reducing rapidly each day as we move towards completion. After Springfield, we will transfer the logistics operations of our UST business, currently located in Jacksonville, Florida, followed by the accessories business located in the original Columbia, Missouri location. And then finally, the Crimson Trace logistics operations located in Wilsonville, Oregon. Our move into the new facility is on schedule, and its completion will allow us to completely eliminate three office and warehouse locations, two in Missouri and one in Florida. It will also allow us to cease using a third-party logistics provider. Our new logistics and customer services facility will allow us to deliver best-in-class levels of service to all of our customers. This facility, combined with our growing family of popular brands and products, will position as well for organic and inorganic growth as we address an ever-increasing portion of the overall shooting, hunting, and rugged outdoor enthusiast market. With that, I'll ask Jeff to provide more detail on our financial results and our updated guidance. Jeff? Thanks, James. Revenue for the quarter was $162 million, an increase of 2.9% over the prior year. Revenue from our firearms segment was $123.6 million, an increase of 5.1%, and revenue from our outdoor products and accessories segment was $41.9 million, a decrease of 6.3% from the prior year. It should be noted that although the electro-optics division was down from the prior year, the outdoor products and accessories division was up 4.3%. Total company gross margin for the quarter was 33.4% compared to 29.8% in the prior year. The firearms um, gross margin was 29% and the outdoor 
product's gross margin was 47.1%. I would note that the outdoor products and accessories segment contributed one-third of the total gross margin of dollars, while the firearms segment contributed two-thirds. The total company gross margin increase was driven mainly by the firearms segment, which had higher production volumes, favorable spending, and lower promotional costs versus the prior year. So before I discuss operating expenses and net income, there are two things I want to note. First, as James mentioned, we have a partial impairment write-off in Q3 associated with the restructuring of the electro-optics business. Specifically, we conducted a required goodwill impairment analysis in that business as a result of the revised revenue forecasts and wrote off $10.4 million of the $54 million of total goodwill related to that business. Second, as I have noted before, the ramp up of the new logistics facility is generating some duplicate expense in the short term as planned. However, in the long run, the new facility will improve our long-term operating costs, bring all of our brands together under one roof, and allow us to present one face to the customer, making it easier for them uh, to do business with us. So taking that into account, GAP operating expenses in the quarter were $56.1 million, including the impairment charge, compared to $41.1 million in the prior year. On a non-GAAP basis, which excludes acquisition-related amortization and the impairment charge, operating expenses were $39.9 million as compared to $35.6 million in the prior year. There are many gives and takes, including the higher costs associated with the logistics facility, but a large portion of the operating ex expense increase in Q3 was because of the accrued incentive compensation and profit sharing, which had been greatly reduced in the prior year. So now turning to net income. GAAP EPS for a Q3 it came in at a loss of $0.10 cents as compared with income of $0.21 cents in the prior year. GAAP EPS in Q3 includes the $10.4 $4 million dollar impairment expense, and that impairment has no related tax benefit because the original purchase of Crimson Trace occurred as a stock transaction. And in last year's GAAP EPS, there was a $9.4 million dollar tax benefit resulting from tax reform. Thus, excluding the $0.17 cent positive impact of tax reform in the prior year, and the 19 cent negative impact of the goodwill impairment in the current year, our GAAP EPS would have been 9 cents in the current um, quarter and 4 cents in the prior uh, comparable um, quarter. Our non-GAAP EPS, which excludes acquisition-related costs, impairments, and the one-time tax reform benefit, was 16 cents in the the current quarter and nine cents in the prior comparable quarter. That result was above the high end of our guidance, primarily due to the increased gross margin previously discussed. Adjusted EBITDA in Q3 increased to $24.4 million for a 15% EBITDA margin as compared to $20 million, a 12.7 percent margin in the prior year. So turning to the balance sheet, operating cash flow in a quarter was $11.7 million and capital spending was $8.3 million, most of which was related to the new logistics and customer services facility and the laser light asset acquisition. For the year to date, operating cash flow was 20.2 seven million dollars versus operating cash outflow in the prior year of 4.5 million dollars. 
We have lowered our expectations for capital spending this fiscal year to approximately 18 to $20 million, excluding the logistics of facility and any acquisitions. Most of that capex is related to IT and new product development. Overall, our expected capital spending in this fiscal year will be 43 to $45 million, including IT and the equipment for the logistics facility. Separately, you will recall that we entered into a $47 million capital lease this year to finance the construction of the, log of the logistics facility itself, which was non-cash. Third quarter inventory levels increased a bit year over year and decreased um, sequentially from Q2. As I have noted before, as we transition to our new logistics facility, we're maintaining extra inventory as safety and buffer stock. In addition, our outdoor products and accessories division accelerated the purchase of some inventory relating to high volume SKUs to help mitigate any potential China tariff impacts. At the end of Q3, our balance sheet remains strong with approximately $37.5 million of cash and $145.5 million of total net borrowings compared to last year's net um, uh, Q3, like net uh, borrowings of just over $200 million. So now turning um, to our outlook, we are maintaining our yearly non-GAAP guidance. Thus, for our, fis our, our, our full year fiscal 19, we estimate revenue to be in a range of 625 to 635 million dollars in full year non-GAAP EPS of between 69 and 73 cents. Full year GAAP EPS includes the Q3 impairment and associated negative tax benefit and is now estimated at 19 to 23 cents. Excluding the impairment, our full year GAAP EPS estimate remains at 38 to 42 cents. For the fourth quarter, we expect revenue of between 162 and 172 million dollars. We expect GAAP EPS of between three cents and seven cents and non-GAAP EPS of between 11 and 15 cents. In both our fourth quarter and full fiscal year numbers, our non-GAAP EPS excludes amortization and costs related to our acquisition. Our estimates are based on our current fully diluted share count of 55 million shares and a tax rate for Q4 of approximately 28%. So back to James. Thanks, Jeff. With that, operator, please open up the call for questions from our analysts. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, please press the star, then the number one key on your touchtone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to remove yourself from the queue, you may do so by pressing the pound key. Again, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, that's star, then one. Our first question comes from the line of Kai Von Rumer with Cowan & Company. Your line is now open. Yes, thank you very much. So um, you took an impairment on the electro-optics, and yet, I mean, I don't sense that your firearm sales were a disappointment. And given that electro-optics is related to firearms, how come the sales missed or, you know, you, you brought the estimate down? It's, it's, it's based, you know, so the impairment is based on uh, a couple of model methods. You know, one of is discounted um, on cash flow. And it's more than just what's happening in, in quarter four. It's, what's, it's the long-range um, forecast. And uh, it's also um, judged about how the forecast looks against how the forecast was when you originally uh, did the acquisition. Q3, the Crimson Trace, you know, did have quite a down um, quarter, uh, which again, 
I think is entirely uh, related, it's industry related and not crimson um, trace related. So, you know, so taking into account the long range um, forecast uh, as compared to our original forecast when we uh, acquired it um, and doing the impairment analysis in conjunction with the restructuring, um, you know, we ended up I'm, I'm taking a, uh, an impairment of about like 20 percent of the goodwill associated with the acquisition. Right. I mean, so therefore we should assume since the time of the acquisition, uh, your longer term sales forecast for firearms also is somewhat softer? Well, since the acquisition, I mean, I think we, you know, the acquisition that was back in, in 2015, and I, I think that yeah. indeed our our firearms um, sales have gotten softer over that that period of time. And, you know, we've, so we've, you know, we took down, you know, yeah. the year in 2018, 2019. Yeah, it's a very different market environment tied to what we were right, experiencing. Right. I forgot yeah. it was that that far back. What? Um, so you'd mentioned the duplicative uh, costs of the new facility. How much were they in the third quarter, approximately? And you know, where should they be in the fourth quarter? When do they peak? When do they kind of go away? Give us some color on that, if you could. Well, um, you, you know, we haven't given any. Um, any any color on the actual like dollar amount of, of the cost, but I can um, I'm talk about you know the peaking. I, I think the peaking is more in Q4 and in, in Q1 of uh, of, uh, of next year, where we're really going to see the benefit is as soon as we can integrate uh, our Jackson our Jacksonville uh, facility. Um, which will be, uh, you know, it's 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 a, a fully functional warehouse with uh, um, all kinds of shipping, receiving, accounting, etc. And w once that is uh, is brought in, which is scheduled for, you know, I sort of toward mid, um, towards the later end of the calendar year, you know. Like summer fall type thing, um, so then you know, then you're really going to um, um, see some um, um, the cost savings of that will offset any of the costs of uh, of the uh, of the of the logistics center. Okay, and my last one is on on your prior call, you'd mentioned that you were testing the IT system and testing the material handling system. Given that you started to run uh, the product through. I assume those tests went went smoothly. Yeah, it's correct. Um, very smoothly. In fact, the team's done a wonderful job. Um, I I really do have to praise them, and I'm happy to do that very publicly. There's a large number of people in our business involved in executing this strategic initiative, and and I have to say they're pretty much flawless right now in that execution. Terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Kai. Our next question comes from the line of James Hardiman with Wedbush. Your line is now open. Hi, good evening. Um, so um, I thought the answer to the, the last question was helpful. Uh, you, you talked about how your firearms assumptions are down certainly since 2015. That shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. I, I guess my question would be um, have they come down since December? Um, I guess specifically in the context of uh, full year guidance is unchanged, uh, better than expected results in the third quarter, with the implication being uh, 4Q is going to be modestly worse than you previously thought. So maybe you know, help me connect those dots, and uh, what, if anything, does that say sort of beyond the fourth quarter, which obviously ends pretty soon? Right. Um, okay. So with respect to your your first question, which was sort of relating the impairment and, and firearms being down since um, December. So, you know, we, I mean, there's not a lot of, of change. Uh, you know, at the revenue level, you know, we sort of barely beat, like, the midpoint, and we're just not um, – I'm changing, like, uh, on, on the full year. So, you know, like you said, there's maybe 
a modest uh, change of, of Q4, but really the changes between Q3 and Q4, you know, on the bottom line, about, you know, it, so we had a beat in, in, in Q3 of about five cents against the midpoint. So that five cents is, is broken down as being three cents is really associated with movement between the quarter. Um, so a little better in, in Q3 than we thought. The mix is getting to the lower end of the price point in Q4. You just saw the February mix results, I think, you know, much worse than, than most, most people expected. There is just a lot of bargain um, hunting in the market. So the lower end um, on products, um, which, you know, typically have a lower um, gross margin. And, and so that's where the gross margin and the dollars are kind of moving between uh, Q3 and Q4. The other um, two cents is associated with the bankruptcy of one of our, our, our distributors, AccuSport, which uh, keeps uh, up with what we think are frivolous um, um, claims that we are willing to fight, but it does cost money to uh, um, fight that, and we're willing to um, do that. Um, and so there's a couple couple um, pennies uh, of that in Q4. Yeah, other than that, I, I would say that that you know the year is kind of a proceeding. Mostly as expected, uh, but again, I think the market is is the, the firearms market is pretty soft. Sure. Um, and then I guess my second question, um, you know, I guess the million dollar question here. I mean, fiscal nineteen it has been a year, will continue to be a year where you know you're going to be able to to grow um, both the top line and the bottom line despite a really weak. And market in large part because you're comping over, you know, weak gross margin numbers, weak ASP numbers. Um, I guess when does that tailwind run out? Um, and ultimately, you know, if things don't get meaningfully better in fiscal 20, um, where, if anywhere, would would the growth come from? Well, I think I think that you know we believe that we have excellent growth prospects in the outdoor products and accessories market. Um, there's uh, just a lot of good things happening there that we've, you know, actually James went through a lot of that last um, quarter, and that is really unchanged. The firearms market, I think I agree with you that we have ma we've managed to weather a fairly weak market through, I think, a lot of innovative um, a promotional activity that is desirable for consumers, yet not overly costly uh, for us. These these bundle programs that we started last um, summer, about nine months ago, and have continued are are really um, I really um, I think you know one of the things that has helped us. I continue to sort of meet expectations in a weak market. Yeah, I'm going back just to and I emphasize what Jeff was saying. You know, uh, the growth really is going to come from the outdoor products uh, and accessories division. You know, we're close to you know on the DC now, so we're really ramping that facility, consolidating everything under one roof is going to be extremely beneficial for us. And once we've completed that process, then we can start looking again at inorganic growth, and we will be able to rapidly integrate you know, what we've always called tuck-in acquisitions. And being able to harvest those synergies so quickly will also make us competitive in any process we decide to enter um, and complete. So we're very excited about that dimension of our overall strategy when it comes, comes to our facility in Missouri. Great. And then if I could just sneak in one last question, um, the, the write down that you had in the third quarter, you know, sometimes companies have uh, one write down and that's the beginning of, of sort of a, 
a, a, a waterfall from there. What degree of confidence do you have that this is it, um, and how close are we to sort of incremental write downs um, as we move forward? Um, well, you know, I, it, it's hard to um, specify confidence or not in you know my future actions, but I can. I tell you this. Crimson Trace is being rolled into bat, into uh, outdoor um, products and accessories, what used to be called Battenfeld. So it will no longer be judged on its own. It's now going to be judged along with the entire segment of outdoor products and accessories. Before, because it was a standalone operation, it was judged on a standalone basis. So there won't there won't be any more, uh, if we have an impairment, if we happen to have an impairment, it won't, it won't be because of Crimson Trace. It'll be, well, you know, this is, this is occurring in outdoor um, products. Um, and there's, you know, when your goodwill is lumped together with lots of other um, things, including acquisitions that are performing very well, like, uh, you know, the, our, our, our cutlery acquisitions, uh, including what was called Taylor Knives and Bubba, then that means, you know, over, you know, you just look at the overall uh, uh, impairment. You don't look at individual impairments. Got it. Helpful. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. As a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, that is star, then one, if you'd like to ask a question. Our next question comes from line of Scott Stember with CL King. Your line is now open. Uh, good evening. Hi, Scott. Um, just dovetailing on James's uh, you know inquiry into 2020. Uh, I know you're not giving guidance, but just from a higher level, once again, um, you, you guys are incurring a significant amount of costs related to the you know the DC and the shift and uh, you know running duplicate facilities. How much or could you just frame out the, the, the benefit um, to the bottom line that you'll potentially get next year just from eliminating those costs, uh, assuming that, let's say, by the middle of the year next year, um, a lot of that is gone? Right. Well, I mean, right now we have the facility, uh, you know, the new facility in the same, in the same town uh, in Missouri we have another a facility that was in the original uh, Battenfeld acquisition. They also have uh, a couple of warehouse, external warehouse um, facilities that are leased, uh, external logistics um, provider. I mentioned Jacksonville um, as a completely standalone operation, um, uh, which is basically U.S. Um, T. So, I mean, there there is uh, it, it, we have another uh, like logistics and and warehouse. Uh, actually, like two of them here in uh, Massachusetts. I mean, all that's going away. So, you know, there there are there's you know, there's a lot of cost savings. And then, of course, as I mentioned a couple of years ago, the original. Um, or one of the, the paybacks on the logistics of facility is a saving in state taxes um, because um, everything, for example, from Massachusetts is going to be shipped to Missouri, all, uh, all the firearms, and then those will be um, shipped around, around the country. So the, the profits um, on that will mostly be um, contained to uh, the Smith and Wesson organization, and not in the logistics um, a facility, since the logistics facility is the one that will have the contact and the nexus with all the states. It'll have a much lower um, uh, profit. So we're, you know, we expect to harvest synergies and cost savings in multiple areas. Uh, we also have a shared services organization now. That, that allows us to um, uh, have one accounting team, one HR team, et cetera. So it, it, it takes time, um, you know, and then of course the final 
uh, synergy is not off the current uh, p and ls what James mentioned. It's the ability to do acquisitions immediately, integrate those acquisitions, and so you you buy them on the EBITDA margin, but you earn them on the gross margin. Got it. That was helpful. Uh, just looking at the fourth quarter in a vacuum, if I'm just looking at the two quarters, uh, obviously we're looking for, I guess, on the high end, flattish sales. But if you look at the pre-tax income line, I guess, uh, basing on what you think the tax rate will be year over year, I mean, you're looking at like a 50% decline. I know you talked about some elevated costs. I guess the peak is coming, right, as far as um, the warehouse stuff that we talked about and the duplicative costs. But is that really what's driving that, or is there something else on the gross margin side from a pricing standpoint or something else that we could uh, just just pin it on? I mean, if you're looking at the the pre-tax non-GAAP, like numbers, it's not a 50% um, um, decline. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm sure what you're doing. But don't forget that on the gap numbers, because of um, the impairment, didn't you couldn't, you can't take a, uh, you can include that in, in as a deduction in taxable income. It, it artificially raises the rate, uh, tax rate in, in Q3, and that impairment hits the bottom line like, directly. If you just look um, on 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 non-GAAP, it's it's certainly the you know with what I've estimated, uh, you know the pre-tax is 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 you know it's it's in the same you know it's in the same area. Okay, and, and the last, um, James, just maybe just talk about the industry. Obviously, um, we had, a, I guess, a little bit of a, of a, a head fake in, in January and February. Things have come back down. Maybe just from a, from a little bit of a higher level, what do you think it takes to get the industry, um, I guess, to be moving forward again? I, I assume that the underlying conditions with and shooting sports and all those other things haven't changed, but... Just maybe give us your view on 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 what we could expect, uh, or is it really just wait and see at this point? Well, I think in the absence of any fear-based buying, you're just going to see a very stable market. As I said in the prepared remarks, retailers, distributors are comfortable with their level of inventory now. Um, I will add that you know most are very optimistic, and you know are looking forward to the future, running their business as well, managing their inventory and their cash well. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of people, a lot of distributors and retailers who are in very, very strong positions. So I think that's great for the industry overall. You know, what will happen in the market, and we've all seen, you look at history, how volatile it can be, who knows in that respect. But I think the key takeaway right now is that it's, it's stable, it's manageable, uh, we can grow. We can make money. Got it. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. We have a follow-up question from Line of Kive on Rumor with Cowan and Company. Your line is now open. Yes. In light of the state's say, uh, tax savings, um, what sort of a tax rate should we think about for the fourth quarter and for next year? What range of tax rates? Well, for the fourth um, quarter, it should be about 28 um, percent. You know, in the it, in the long run, you know, um, assuming a very uh, um, profitable business, because obviously you have to have like profits in order to earn a, a, a tax benefit. Um, it'll probably come down. Um, you know. A point or two, I mean, maybe 25 or 26, but that's probably not going to be in, impacted until the second half of, of uh, fiscal year 2020. Got it. And then last one, CapEx, roughly, I mean, you, it's a little lighter this year. Is it up, down next year, rough, rough thoughts of the range where it could be? 
I think next year is, you know, so our, our non ascent or our not, our, sorry, our non, um, logistics facility, um, on CapEx was 18 to like $20 million. I, I don't think it'll be much higher than that next year. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. We have a follow up question from the line of James Hardiman with Wedbush. Your line is now open. Hey, just a couple quick follow-ups. I just want to be clear. When, when you say um, in the absence of fear-based buying, it, it's, it's likely to be a stable market, um, I guess stable would, would feel like an improvement from here, given what we saw in February and what we've, we've really seen over the course of the last year. I, I guess, am I thinking about that the wrong way? And, and realistically, can we get back to flat pretty soon? I mean, obviously – uh, February and March, you've got some really difficult comparisons. Yeah, I, I was about to say, James. I mean, we're, 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 but yeah, and go ahead. No, it's not an apples with apples comp right now because very, it was very different um, buying behavior by the consumer occurring uh, last year versus this year. So people shouldn't have been surprised that we were double digit down in terms of adjusted uh, next checks at all. Um, still, there was a sequential improvement from January to February, so normal seasonality is in play. That sequential improvement, you could say, is obviously weaker than in prior years, but if you look back into other years, pretty standard. And that's, that's really what, you know, as I use as much data as possible to give my best opinion, that's where my comment about stability comes from. Um, I, the comps, as you said, they will not get easier until we get into June until we get into summer. And then quickly we'll be approaching, you know, the you know, the fall season and we all know what happens then. And that's the true judge, I think, of the health of the market, you know, in the absence of any, you know, fear based buying, which, you know, I hope that's that's what happens. You know, we want a stable market environment. Okay. Uh, go ahead. I um so I would add also that the distributor inventory in terms of units has now been pretty stable for the last, you know, five to six um, um, quarters. So, you know, we got out of that uh, a period of time in which we were trying to work down that inventory, and now it's, it's really stable it's at, at, a, at a, a dollar amount, which I think helps with forecasts and expectations, you know, other than – the uh, you know the give and take at the at the consumer market. Yeah, it, it, it gives us a much stronger connection to actually what's happening at the retail counter. <laughs> Got it. And then uh, the the last one for me, you, you kind of touched on this, but but ASPs were down in handguns. You had had some nice tailwinds there uh, previously. Uh, I think what you said is that was less about promotions and more about mix. Uh, but how should we think about ASPs going forward? It, it sounds like you're basically guiding to, to continued sort of negative mix. But are, I guess are we starting to see promotions tick back up, or you know, how do we think about the other components of, of ASP going forward? It, it really was, as you think about handguns, it really was product mix driven by promotional activity. So you know, obviously, as, as we execute our promotional plans. In, in the first part of the calendar year, first quarter of the calendar year, um, you know, we're, we're, we're promoting across a broad section of our product portfolio. And there are some that resonated way more strongly um, with retailers uh, than others. And that really drove the mix change, somewhat lowered those ASPs. And that, that's what we're seeing. And how about going forward? You, you think that that trend will continue? Going forward, I mean, those, those as I said in the prepared remarks, you know, we're in the latter stages now of that promotion, this promotional period. So it's going to end fairly soon. Um, so you know, as we as we get into the next fiscal year, that promotion has ended. Okay. Thanks. That's helpful. Uh, thanks, guys, and good luck. Thanks, James. Take care. I'm showing no further questions in queue at this time. I'd like to turn the call back to James Debney for closing remarks. Right there. 
I want to thank everyone across the American Outdoor Brands team for their commitment and dedication to excellence. Thank you everyone for joining us today and we look forward to speaking with you next quarter. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your participation in today's conference. This concludes the program and you may now disconnect. Everyone, have a great day.